Welcome to Bug Banter with the Xerces Society, where we explore the world of invertebrates and discover how to help these extraordinary animals. If you want to support our work, go to xerces.org slash give. Hi, I'm Matthew in Oregon. And I'm Rachel in Missoula, Montana. We're all familiar with beetles, and I mean the insect, not the pop band. And I have to admit that it was sharing an office with a beetle enthusiast that first got me interested in insects as a conservation topic. You look around your home or neighborhood and you'll find them. But just how familiar with them are we truly? I mean, what makes a beetle a beetle and how many different species are there and what role do they play in our world? To help us explore the world of beetles is Jennifer Hopwood, who works for the Xerces Society as a senior pollinator conservation specialist, which frankly is a job title that doesn't really encompass all that she does. Yep, Jennifer does provide advice and training for restoring and managing pollinator habitat in a variety of landscapes, but she also focuses on conserving other beneficial insects, including beetles. Jennifer has authored many articles and publications and is a co-author of several books, including Farming with Native Beneficial Insects. Welcome, Jennifer. Yeah, thanks for having me. Yeah, of course. We're excited to have you here. So to start, uh, can you tell us in scientific terms, what is a beetle? What makes a beetle a beetle? Sure. Well, beetles are insects and like other insects, they have three body regions and six legs, a pair of an antenna and two pairs of wings. Um, but beetles have four wings that are hardened and thickened and with the delicate membranous wings underneath that they use for flying and they're folded up underneath those thickened and hard hardened forewings. Um, and they are in the order Coleoptera. And that name is derived from Greek and it translates to sheathed wings. So their forewings provide this protection for their wings. And um, I think I've read a really nice description that they're sort of equipped to go from being a tank to an airplane really well, but that that protection really means that they've been successful in our world, really successful. And they can be very tiny, anywhere from a fourth of a millimeter to all the way up to about 20 centimeters. So like if you were to compare that to mammals, size difference in mammals, it would be like a teeny tiny little shrew and a blue whale, just a huge range in, in sizes. Thank you for that description, Jennifer. I love it. They're almost like the original transformers going from huh. being a tank to an airplane, which is <laughs> so cool. <laughs> <laughs> That's a great way to visualize it, Rachel. Especially since they they have these four different life stages. They go from egg to larva to people and adults. And the larva look very different than the adults. So they they really do transform in dramatic ways. And you were giving us a scientific explanation of or description of what a beetle is. Um, and from that, we know that beetles are not true bugs as such. And yet, you know, we have beetles that we call ladybugs, which now we know are not bugs, but they're beetles. So can you explain, you know, why a ladybug isn't a bug and is actually a beetle? Yeah, sure. And well, you you know, the bugs are this loose term that many people use to describe insects, but for entomologists, it really refers to a specific group of insects, the true bugs in the order Hemiptera. And Hemiptera, their name origin comes from like half wing or something like that, because they have sort of leathery hardened, um, their four wings are half hardened and then half membranous. So, um, but all the groups in true bugs are um, have piercing sucking mouth parts mm -hmm. and some are plant feeders many and some feed on prey and use their piercing sucking mouth parts to pierce into their prey um so true bugs have a very different way of of growing too rather than um, beetles which go through those four different life stages of egg larva pupa and adult um, true bugs have sort of more incomplete metamorphosis and they're young um, start out looking pretty close to what the adults look like. They resemble small adults in a lot of ways. They don't have wings to start with, but as they grow and go through different 
molts, they just increasingly look more and more like the adults. And they also live in the same place that the adults live and often feed on the same foods. Beetles, on the other hand, their larvae look super different than adults. And sometimes they eat very different things too. So there's some pretty big differences in their lifestyles. And somewhere along the line, I think that lady beetles got nicknamed ladybugs, maybe because bug is such a familiar term. Um, but right, they're, they're beetles and they have convex bodies with those hard wing covers. They're often red with black spots and they're really familiar and easy to recognize and have been for a long, long time. And um, in fact, the, there's this legend that lady beetles got their name dating back to medieval times when farmers would see them in their fields and recognize that when they had these lady beetles in their fields, they had better yields to their crops. Because lady beetles are really important predators, especially eating aphids and other soft body pests. And so um, they called these insects our ladies beetles. Um, and so hmm. that's how lady beetles, they've just been a part of human history and knowledge, I think for a long, long time. We have a lot of fondness for them. That's so interesting because I think we think of lady beetles, aka ladybugs, as these gentle, cute little animals, but they're actually quite ferocious. <laughs> <laughs> they totally are. <laughs> they are really fierce. Yeah. Um, before I ask you my next question, can you just give our audience a couple examples of a true bug? Things like an assassin bug that are hunters, those are predators. Um, there's also ambush bugs that they kind of blend in on flowers and they wait and leap upon flower visitors. But other really more common plant feeders are aphids and white flies and mealybugs or stink bugs, damsel bugs. Those are all true bugs. Interesting. I feel like a lot of people probably have heard of a lot of those and yet we call any insect a bug. <laughs> can get yeah. confusing. Well, yeah. <laughs> Bug is sort of an affectionate term though, too, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, this is called bug banter. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right. Yeah. So there are lots of different species of beetles in North America and around the world. Can you give us a sense of the diversity that we're, what, that we have? Um, there's probably at least 400,000 species of beetles around the world. So it's a tremendously huge diversity. Um, just to put that in perspective, that's like a quarter of all known animal species or beetles. Wow. It's astonishing. Um, in the US, I think we have about 25,000 beetles that we know of. So those are just the numbers of species that we know, but there are most assuredly many more out there that haven't been identified or scientifically described, or we just haven't even discovered yet. So um, it's a really diverse group. The, by far is the most diverse insect group, even though I feel like if there are fly biologists listening or wasp biologists listening, they're thinking we're catching up, we're catching up, but they still have a long way to go. Um, those are really diverse groups too, but they have a long way to go to, to surpass beetles. Wow. Yeah, I think probably one of the best known um, quotes, although is it a true quote or not, it comes from the biologist J.B.S. Haldane, who was asked about what, you know, thinking about religion and, and God and creation is like, well, what, what do you think God was doing? And he said, well, he had an, it, what they say is he said he had an inordinate fondness for beetles, just because there are such huge diversity of beetles out there. Yeah, yeah, one of the, the most, um, the thing that stuck with me from reading a long time ago was that there was a story about Charles Darwin, the story that he told mm -hmm. about him collecting beetles. And he was such an avid collector and he was out in the field and he was seeing all these different new kinds of beetles. So he had one in one hand and one in another. And he saw another one that he had to have that he had never seen before but he had no place to put these beetles in his hand. So he put one in his mouth, which is not an unusual like collection technique. If you need to put it somewhere really briefly, if you're also sure it's not gonna hurt you, but really unfortunately it was a type of beetle that spews out acid as a defense. <laughs> it was a bombardier beetle, wasn't it? <laughs> yeah, it was. <laughs> so he put it in his mouth and then he 
I think she said, and as it happens, you know, I lost all the feels that I was trying to capture. <laughs> um, but it's just, I, I love it so much because I think it speaks to just how much people love Beatles and have been really interested in entranced with Beatles for so long because they do look so different and kind of wild in a lot of ways. So, yeah. Yeah, and, and I mean, with so many species, they, beetles must play an important role in our environment as well. I mean, I, I can't imagine that a, did you say a quarter, twenty percent of known animal species are beetles. I mean, that's that that's just crazy. I mean, so there must be ways in which they help shape our ecosystems, or I mean, more selfishly, just kind of be beneficial to us. Yeah, absolutely. And th with such a diverse group, they do kind of do. They do all sorts of different things. They do it all, really. Um, there are herbivorous beetles that feed on plants, and they feed on all different plant parts. And that can keep certain plants from becoming overabundant in plant communities, which can be important. But also, those beetles that eat plants, in turn, become food sources for wildlife and can be really valuable sources of food for other arthropods or mammals or um, especially birds that feed their young insects. Um, so herbivorous beetles are things like weevils or leaf beetles or scarab beetles. Um, but then there are also the predators. We've talked about lady beetles and what voracious predators they are, but there are also soldier beetles and fireflies, tiger beetles and ground beetles, and rove beetles. And a whole suite of beetles that live in freshwater that are predatory in freshwater mm -hmm. Um, and predatory beetles hunt and consume other insects and arthropods on plants or in the soil. And sometimes they also even eat larger organisms like snails and worms and slugs. Um, so they can be very valuable in a lot of different systems, especially as crop predators in garden. They can help control those um, pests in gardens and crops and um, probably they contribute several billion dollars worth of pest control every year. So that's, wow. they're economically valuable um, as well as ecologically valuable. Um, but beetles can also be decomposers. They break down dead plant tissue or animal tissue or um, fungi sometimes too. Um, mm -hmm. They help break down, um, I guess they aid the decomposition of other organisms things like bacteria and fungi that are already really, really critical for, for decomposition. They help those organisms by breaking down larger tissues into smaller tissues. And so <clears throat> they're really important, those decomposing beetles for soil health in particular. And because soil health is so foundational to so much of life, that's a really valuable group to us and to ecosystems as well. And the decomposers include dung beetles, carrion beetles, or um, hide beetles, uh, which are things like carpet beetles that eat um, hair and feathers and skin, keratin-rich sources that are hard to break down. Those hide beetles get in there and break it down. Um, or beetles that break down rotting wood, like longhorn beetles or best beetles. And then things that eat detritus, like ground beetles and some species of road beetles. So it's a it's a really diverse group of decomposers. Um, and then another important role is contributing to pollination. And beetles can be pretty messy pollinators in some ways because they also chew on the flower parts. Some do, and they don't always move around a lot between flowers. Um, but when but for some plants beetles are, are just what they need. And um, flowers that are pollinated by beetles usually are really large flowers with, with like a very open structure and open um, anthers that beetles can kind of get in there and roll around and spread really easily. And so those are- Beetles may have been the earliest of the insect pollinators. Yeah. From what, from what, from what I remember. And I mean, things like the magnolia. So if you- mm -hmm. You know, the southern magnolia with that huge white flower or water lilies, those seem yeah. to be beetle, big, big showy beetle pollinated things. So. Yeah, absolutely. And who knows, that may have really helped their expansion. You know, once they discovered mm -hmm. flowering plants, it may have really 
help them occupy new space and expand diversity. So, um, so yeah, they do play a number of really important roles. Wow. For someone who doesn't know a lot about beetles, which I'll admit, I'm one of those people. I was so excited today to learn more. It's kind of mind blowing. <laughs> I'm like, we really just need beetles in our yards and yeah, they're just great for, for everything really. Um, so you just listed a lot of different types of beetles and I'm excited because we're actually going to just talk about different cool beetles and, and examples. So <laughs> I want to start, I'm curious of what is your, maybe not favorite, but what beetle intrigues you the most that you've come across and why? And can you tell us a little bit about that beetle? Hmm. Oh, okay. I have, I have a good one. This is one that I only just found in my yard really recently. So it's a ripocerid beetle and they are about an inch, maybe a little bit larger kind of dark brown beetles, but they have these really long feathery antennas that they unfurl and presumably that helps them either find mates or track down their prey, which are cicadas. And so um, I live in Nebraska and we have these annual cicadas and then we also have periodic cicadas. Um, and these ripophorid beetles are parasites of them. So the adults are out around the same time that you would find cicadas and they find the larva, cicada larva, which feed on the, the roots of trees. So their larva dig, or their, their adults dig down, lay their eggs, and then their larva feed on cicada, um, uh, cicada nymphs, sorry. Cicadas don't have larva, they have nymphs. <laughs> um, so yeah, the beetles parasitize these cicadas and it's just really unusual to see them they're just yeah I've, I've only seen one like every 10 years so really yeah, I was going to ask do, do they have the same periodic cycle I mean you mentioned annual cicadas and periodic I mean periodic or whatever, every 13 17 something like that to so the larvae yeah. underground living on the cicada nymphs for that period of time and or do they I I don't have the don't answer know. to that question. It's a really great question. It could it, they could totally be long living. Some beetles do live for extraordinary long periods of time, like decades. Some of the ones that live in that bore through wood, yeah. you know, they, they they will be inside. You know, I mean, I, I'm I'm from Britain with a lot of like wood timber cottages and stuff, and so people will have a cottage, and there's so many anecdotes of these wood boring beetles appearing out of beams that have been in cottages for decades oh my gosh, that's uh, you know and so you're like wow this this thing's been inside that house development's just really slow when the wood's not growing any longer so it probably takes a long time to digest wood it's yeah, hard to, it does. It's hard to break yep. down so mm -hmm. <laughs> it's a special kind of beetle yeah i know you've worked a lot with um ground beetles predatory beetles i mean you're I mean, one of, one of the beetles that I get in my garden, which I think is really cool, is the um, Scaphanotus, the snail and slug beetle, um, which has this wide um, abdomen, but a narrow head and thorax, so it can get its front end into snail shells to chase the snail around to munch them out. But I mean, that's just one particular example of, of, of a ground beetle. I mean, there are several more that are equally vicious, aren't there? Yeah, and I'm... Thanks for thanks for thinking of ground beetles in particular. When Rachel asked which beetle group I liked a lot, I was thinking, well, gosh, that's one I come across a lot, and I really like that group. I feel really fond of them. Anytime I'm digging in my garden, I find one, and it always pretends to be dead right away. <laughs> and try to, you know, send off leave me alone vibes. Um, but that's a, it's such an interesting group because. They, like you, you gave a really good example of their predation. They're really good predators. And there are um, some farmers that want to encourage ground beetles so much that they'll install habitat geared towards ground beetles within their fields or right around the borders of their fields. They'll create these beetle banks um, that are planted, just these berms that are planted with bunch grasses. And the idea is ground beetles will overwinter in the clumps of grass and um, then move into the fields early in the springtime to eat the pests of the crops. Um, 
that ground beetles also eat weed seeds, some of them do, and some of them are decomposers, breaking down like plant material. So they, they really do so many different things, but that's definitely a group you can, you can find just about anywhere you go, dig a little bit, and they are really, you know, they're not very showy, they're black or brown, and they are not, not super flashy <laughs> on a scale of beetles, because so many other beetles are more colorful or beautiful, but they are really, um, they're really important. Some of them can be um, like violet colored, although I think that's it's true. one of the, it's, it's one of the non-native ones. It's the, uh, that's the showy no, one around here. You're yeah, right. But... We do have one, like the, it's called the fiery searcher in here, oh, in yeah. this, oh, man. this is part oh. where I live and it's um, like kind of greenish blue and they yeah. crawl up on plants and they are a little bit flashy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah no, I'm, I'm, yeah. I've only seen photographs of that one, but it is a pretty cool, because some 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 beetles are remarkably bright and colorful. Um, you know, I think of tiger beetles as being the metallic ones, but there's also boring mm -hmm. beetles and you know some of the ones that you find on flowers that when you see them, you're like, whoa, really? And it's yeah. like the colors are remarkable. Yeah. yeah, some of them are like you said, the like the longhorn beetles, some of those beetles are really flashy, you know, they're orange with certain mm -hmm. patterns or bright yellow and yeah, they're not shy. They're not hiding. <laughs> <laughs> or there's a giant black and white locust beetle. I mean, it's huge. Oh, and yeah. it's just got these giant black and white curlicues on it. And like, they're not afraid of birds, apparently. <laughs> <laughs> when you say giant, how big are we talking in terms of, of inches? Oh, probably an inch and a half to two inches. So big. And then they have wow. these giant long antenna that kind of peel back and are longer than their body so yeah it really is big are there any particularly weird beetles that you know of? i mean some of the characteristics you've already mentioned would probably be considered <laughs> weird to most people um but are there any that really you're just like man those those beetles are weird <laughs> very strange yeah i think one group that i don't really know that much about but i think is really strange are the the telephone pole beetles and it's the last remaining species in a family that's gone extinct and so mm -hmm. it's like an ancient group with one remaining species and the weird thing about this beetle is um and maybe these are i don't know if it's this, you know but they they matthew you mentioned the beetles that come out of the beams but mm -hmm. they do live in decaying wood um like old telephone poles and eat that wood the weirdest thing about them, though, is that they reproduce as larvae and usually without mating. So it's just this really unusual strategy. Is it just like a two? It's like egg larvae, egg larvae, egg larvae, and and that's it. I think they do. They can go on to adulthood, but they don't reproduce as adults. Oh, so okay. What do they do as adults? Because they just hang out. Their primary <laughs> goal has already been achieved if they've made it. Right? So I just don't. I don't know. So that one's a really strange group. Um, yeah, because something else you mentioned over the freshwater beetles. And I mean, I know there's like whirly gig beetles that you see spinning around on on the mm -hmm. on the surface of ponds and stuff. But there's also diving beetles, and I'm like, how do they breathe? Do they have like little oh. aqua lungs or like little scuba gear they they put on to go down? Oh my gosh, Matthew, that's a great question. Actually, this is really neat. I mean, they kind of create their own scuba gear, right? They go to the surface and they grab a bubble and uh -huh. they hold it, um, sometimes other under their wings. Um, and then they sort of use that bubble to breathe. And when they need a new bubble, they go to the surface and get some more air. Um, yeah, because yeah. to me, beetles, I mean, beetles breathe through the through the spiracles and trachea in their, in their um, abdomen, right? And so... Yeah they so what you describe is they essentially kind of coat themselves in 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 air which then they can absorb they don't have to like take big mouthfuls um so they just wow yeah just, yeah they yeah they live up a bubble and i don't know how long it can last that's a great question hopefully um, the beetles know <laughs> i'm sure yeah <laughs> and you mentioned the whirligig beetles one thing I think is really neat about them is they have these eyes that sort of, they do double duty. They can see above the surface and below the surface at the same time. So <laughs> it's great for them for hunting 
and for protecting themselves against predators that want to eat them because there's a lot of things that like to eat bugs and water so mm -hmm. um yeah that's pretty they're pretty fun to see wow that's so interesting so I think a lot of the characteristics that we've talked about beetles make them very unique uh, to other animals in the animal kingdom, which I think is cool, right? We need to celebrate that and it makes them really useful and fill a really important niche um, in our ecosystems. But I also think that, you know, I think the thing I love about bug banter in this podcast and what we're trying to do is, is get people to connect to invertebrates in a new way, because I think we see them as other, right? They're not like normal animals. They're these creepy crawly things that are in horror films and things we don't want in our house, but they're really incredibly beautiful animals that we actually have, you know, some things in common with, believe it or not. Um, are there any animals that show parental care? That's something we can relate to as humans in showing that. And to think that a beetle could do that um, is pretty interesting. So. Yeah, that's a great question. And it's not, like you said, it's not really very common in insect worlds for insects to meet their offspring, let alone take care of them. Um, but there are a couple of groups of beetles that do take care of them. Um, one are the best beetles, and they're also known as the patent leather beetles, which I love that name so much. And if you could visualize the most shiniest black beetle with these beautiful um, grooves on their forewings, that's the patent leather beetle. She's just really shiny and beautiful. Um, and those beetles live in rotting wood and they, they do overlap with, um, they're young. And so they kind of create these communities and these galleys in wood and they care for their young and they feed their young chewed wood and give them bacteria to help them break down that wood. And they communicate with their young too. They have like 14 different, um, calls or sounds that they make. Oh, wow. with their bodies like these stridulations that send different signals like a warning signal or a calming mm. signal or things like that and that's just really that's something I think we probably all can relate to in some degree that that level of communication and also that sense of care um, and investment that they put into their kids um, and then also um, burying beetles also care for their young they they seek out <laughs> um carrion of course and they have their own preferences for the type of carrion and the size of carrion that they go for and then they dig this hole underneath the body to to really just to protect it and keep it from going to other animals that want to eat carrion because apparently carrion is a pretty hot commodity <laughs> <laughs> in the animal and insect world so there are lots of things that compete for it and so they dig really fast and they do this in pairs, mated pairs. And so the body sinks down and then they cover it up so that, you know, it was like, it was never there. And then they've got this body that they can just feed their young over time. And they, they start to um, break it down with enzymes and then they feed it to their young little by little. So it becomes a big gloopy, disgusting to us, tasty to them mess. <laughs> Um, but it's, it's great. And it's not just the one parent or other that's feeding the young, it's both parents. So that's another kind of unusual thing for insects to do. Um, yeah, and that's, a like that's really important for soil health, you know, cause rotting, rotting carrion provides a ton of nutrients back into the soil. This has been a, a, such a fun conversation. So thank you, Jenny. Um, I know, uh, Obviously, bug banter, we want people to get enthusiastic about insects, um, but we also want them to, to care for them um, and, you know, give people hints about what they can do in their backyard or whatever. So, I mean, uh, people can do things to help beetles, can't they? I mean, I'm assuming there's, you know, you can create habitat for them or whatever. I mean, are, are there a couple of simple hints that you can give people? Yeah, I think a lot of the things that you've already talked about on this program that support pollinators are really beneficial to beetles too because mm -hmm. a lot of those flowering plants that we install in pollinator habitat provide pollen and nectar and that's really important for the life stages of some some beetles but also can support soil health which supports mm -hmm. a lot of these other groups of beetles um, 
but things like minimizing tillage, reducing plastic mulch or really thick layers of bark mulch, that also is really important for a lot of different beetle groups that really rely on the soil. Um, leaving the leaves is a critical mm -hmm. component because that leaf litter is overwintering habitat for um, groups like lady beetles. Um, and this is a little bit more out there, but if you have a log, leaving it in your yard can be really fun or whatever space you're working in, um, that, that can be valuable habitat for different groups of beetles. And um, Artificial light can also be really disruptive to, to beetles during the summer months. So thinking about artificial light could be an important step for some folks like um, it can disrupt mating in the case of fireflies, for example, but it can also draw away a whole bunch of different beetles from habitat and draw them towards lights, which can be hazardous. So thinking about you know, whether you need to leave on your porch light all night long, or if you can just make it motion sensitive or um, have it on a timer or use like a dim or red filtered light, those can reduce light pollution. Um, and like some of the other things you've talked about, ways to get involved in your community to talk about insects and the, the ways we can engage with them, maybe um, spread the word through getting involved in educational programs or community science projects like the mm -hmm. firefly atlas that Cersei's leads those are ways to really um, just i think normalize insects and thinking about insects and making insects a part of our life um, that's really valuable and signage and yards so your neighbors can come by and ask you why you're doing something the way you're doing or if if I get lucky every once in a while asking me for seeds that they can take and put in their own yard. So um, those are things that can help beetles. Yeah, basically make, make, make your yard insect friendly. Yeah, that's a great, that's exactly right. A great way yeah. to summarize it. Thank you, Jennifer. Well, we're going to end on my favorite question of what inspired you. And I actually don't know the answer to this, so I'm really excited, <laughs> extra excited. <laughs> Um, what inspired you to study insects? Yeah. Um, so I had this moment when I was in college. I was getting an ecology degree and I think it was in my last year, maybe in my last semester, but um, I was taking a course called the History and Diversity of Organisms. Yeah. And one of the professors that was teaching it was an entomologist. You know, they'd switch off between a plant biologist and an entomologist and hmm. um the entomologist was Steve Ash he's a he was um a beetle specialist he specialized in rove beetles which is a particularly diverse group and I just remember this moment in class when he introduced diversity of insects and then of course he went on to talk about how diverse beetles were and how diverse rove beetles were in particular because that was his favorite group and I just remember being completely awestruck by it. And that was just the moment in which I thought, I gotta learn more. And that was it. Um, I was definitely a kid that liked to dig around outside, but I never really thought, gosh, I could make a career of thinking about insects or caring about insects, you know? So it was really neat to um, see somebody who had done that in their life. Um, so that's what, I think paved the way to to the work that we do today, for me anyway. Wow. That's great. Well, thank you so much, Jennifer. It was so wonderful having you here today. And we just appreciate you diving into the world of beetles and, and telling us about just their cool characteristics. And um, I've learned a lot and I hope you have had a good time with us and I hope our listeners have as well. So thank you so much again, and we hope to have you back soon. Bug Banter is brought to you by the Xerces Society, a donor-supported non-profit that is working to protect insects and other invertebrates, the life that sustains us. If you are already a donor, thank you so much. If you want to support our work, go to xerces.org slash donate. For information about this podcast and show notes, go to xerces.org slash bugbanter.